This Q&A with Brandon Fugel and Leslie Kane was presented in April 2023 in New York City at an inquiry into anomalous experiences and the phenomenon. This conference series gives an opportunity for the in-person and online audience to interact with featured speakers who are truly making a difference in these fields. If you like this video, you can subscribe to this channel for more great content in the days ahead. And now we bring you Leslie Kane and Brandon Fugel. In a moment, we're going to, you guys are going to get to meet Brandon Fugel, who is the current owner of Skinwalker Ranch. I think most of you know that. And the History Channel has been covering what's been going on there. They have a new season just about to come up. Uh, we're going to show you a trailer for what's about to come up on season four. And I can tell you, I've watched the first episode of it, and it's really fascinating. But I just kind of, I, I just found this incredible quote, Brandon, by you in the book, in this book, which probably many people have read. I just wanted to read it because it kind of sets a, a really great tone for this. Um, hold on a second. So this is, the, this is something Brandon said, which is in this book. He says, I am not a believer. I am an experiencer. I, knew, I know for a fact that it is real and have witnessed with my own eyes, with other credible witnesses at my side, what can only be described as daylight sightings of exotic craft over Skinwalker Ranch. And I think he's witnessed even more than that. So let's look at the trailer and then we'll bring up Brandon and, and we'll get to ask him a bunch of questions. I continue to be shocked by the UAP activity on Skinwalker Ranch. I'm not sure that we've seen this type of phenomenon. The coyotes didn't kill this animal. We should be digging, drilling right there. The closer that we are getting to the answers, the more covert military activity becomes. There is, right there. There's a thing hovering over the launch site. We may be looking at the anomaly for the first time. The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, Tuesday, April 18th at 10, only on the History Channel. I'm so happy to have the privilege of talking to you, Brandon. It's a pleasure to be with you. I've Thank you. Did your work over the Thank last few well, years, groundbreaking in bringing out uh, really the reality of what people have experienced, pilots, government officials, and professionals, and I think that we're just getting warmed up. Well, I think we're here to really talk about what you've been doing and your team has been doing and um, for years at this amazing place, which has this incredible history. And I, I actually, in some of the information that I received about the uh, show, there was this line that really intrigued me that you said that this is the greatest scientific investigation of this generation. Um, so, you know, maybe, I, mean, I don't know, I'm sure a lot of people know about it, but maybe you could just tell us why, you know, what is it about this investigation that's so special? It's a bold statement, and I've taken a lot of uh, hate on Twitter, oh, no. which is the bathroom wall of the internet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, love the haters, bring it on. Uh, but uh, it, I truly believe it is the greatest science project of our time and uh, endeavor. It is true frontier science and research delving into really the reality of the phenomena and for whatever reason it seems to be converging at this very unique location in northeastern Utah that has a rich history uh, 512 acre piece of uh, property that is surrounded by tribal lands that has been really the uh, the subject of intense scientific investigation for now going on 27 years and uh, I, I've owned it for seven years. In fact, closed on the purchase of it a week ago, seven years ago, uh, with Mr. Bigelow, and and count him as a friend. Uh, it was an interesting progress. Pro uh, it was an interesting um, process going through all of that. I, I actually acquired it as a skeptic, as someone who'd never seen a UFO, a ghost, an orb, or anything of the sort. In fact, I had just been coming out of a faith crisis matched with deep skepticism of anything in the paranormal. Uh, I had funded research into uh, gra everything from gravitational physics to over unity energy and had found that the majority of claims, if not all of them, at least I believed at the time, 
uh, had a natural explanation and that there really wasn't anything that extraordinary going on. And so, and I told Mr. Bigelow that when I acquired the property, I said, just in full disclosure, I'm going to bring in my own team of scientists and I fully intend to debunk all of the claims that have been made for so long. I believe that there is most likely a natural prosaic explanation for all that has occurred there. I mean, the human mind is a very powerful thing. And, uh, you know, the group think you get groups of people together that have their own biases that desperately want to believe. And it, it's, it's very easy to get swept up in a zealous movement. You see it with religion. You see it with, with all sorts of different uh, portions of society and belief systems. And I didn't think that this was any, any different. Um, and so that's really how I entered the property, was as, uh, as a skeptic that was willing to put his money where his mouth was. But, uh, but I didn't want my identity ever revealed. I never wanted my name associated with these topics or the ranch. So I set up shell corporations and uh, made everyone sign confidentiality agreements. I, I, I wanted absolutely no notoriety because I, I didn't want the topics associated with the ranch to in any way undermine my professional endeavors uh, that still to this day drive 95% of my time and energy. And, uh, and I, I ultimately, of course, changed my mind. Uh, and you know, History Channel and their top production te team essentially Jedi mind tricked me into coming out. And that's why we're here, I guess. It's been, it, it, it has been an incredible journey. And I, and I want to answer any question you have. But it's a privilege to be with all of you. I know you could be a lot of other places right now. But I think these topics are timely. I think it's time for people to open their eyes. Uh, a lot of the questions that were brought up on the earlier panel with James Fox, uh, I think, are, are interesting and, uh, and well worth expounding on. I, I think that up until this point in time, a lot of people haven't wanted to know the truth. I mean, they want to, but they really don't. Uh, it's like The Matrix. You ever, you've probably all seen the show The Matrix. I found that a lot of people, in fact, the majority of people would just as soon be plugged right back into The Matrix because they can't handle the truth. Can you all handle the truth? Okay. All right. After season four, some of you may need therapy, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm serious. It's going to really f*** people up. <laughs> Shoot. This is, uh, this is like, I'm okay to say that. That's <laughs> I, it's been a long week. Yeah, that's the best plug you can give for season four. Yeah. I can't wait. I, I really can't wait, and I can't wait for the skeptics to see what we have to unveil. I've just been like a caged animal. You have to get them to watch it. That's the problem. To bite my tongue so much <laughs> online because I'm like, gosh, if you people only knew. Um, but it's uh, anyway, so fire no, away, let, Leslie. Let, tell us a little more. So you start out as a skeptic. So tell us where you've landed seven years later. What is the, the what's Boy. the, how would you describe what you know now about what w this thing we call the phenomenon, what have you learned up in these seven years? Well, I, I can honestly say I've spent more money than any private individual on the planet in the last decade relative to investigating the phenomena. That is for sure. And uh, that's no disrespect to uh, my predecessors, to Mr. Bigelow and others. But uh, I have literally, I mean, before even the History Channel series, and the, the docu-series effort was, was allowed within the gates. I mean, millions of dollars spent in, in pursuit of the truth and documenting the reality of the phenomena and trying to understand really the origin and the agenda associated with what we are experiencing. And uh, I've come, come a long ways. I, I obviously have gone from being a skeptic. I mean, people ask me all the time, are you a, a believer? And is your, your quote, from the, the book essentially stated, no, I, I tell people I'm not a believer, I'm an experiencer. And I can't unsee those things that I have witnessed with others standing at my side. And I think when you combine electromagnetic anomalies coupled with acute medical episodes and UFO sightings all happening simultaneously within the same space on the same afternoon, <laughs> It is absolute ignorance to deny the reality of the phenomenon. 
and the, the fact that we are not alone and there is something much more complex happening. We are without question living in a, in a uh, I think a, a very interesting place here on earth. Oh, yeah. um, can you say, can you describe maybe some of the more interesting personal experiences that you've had that you yourself have, have I witnessed? mean, the, the most compelling, the most profound experience was that one that I had on October 14th, 2016, that changed my entire worldview. And, and, it, and it shifted my entire perspective. And from that point on, I doubled down not only with financial investment, but also with, with, with this being very personal. Um, on that day, I, I saw with witnesses at my side who had professed their own skepticism earlier in the day. We saw what can only be described as a flying saucer, uh, as a, this disc-like craft that was hovering right above the Mesa Plateau, right in front of us in broad daylight. And this was not just some blinky, blurry light in the sky or anything like that. It was a, it, an object about 40 to 50 feet long that appeared and changed position instantaneously. I mean, within sec seconds, it could change in the blink of an eye from one position to another, roughly 50 feet, then drop down and then dart to the side again. And then within about 20 seconds, the entire event was over and it was gone. And it was, it was like a bullet shooting off in the distance. And we were all left very stunned sitting there and and the, the shocking thing was was really the fact that all of our smartphones had been drained from about 80 percent to zero before that um and and those smartphones in fact my physicist eric bard who resides full time at the ranch he's there right now in the command center he sleeps there he hasn't left the ranch really in a year and a half before then he was he was spending he spent more time on that property and frankly more time than any other scientist studying the phenomena as far as intense focus than anyone. But he, uh, he had his smartphone that, uh, that was his iPhone was malfunctioning earlier in the day. And we, we were fortunate to, to have him at least have the presence of mind to capture that. I mean, his, his iPhone was changing to purple magenta color. And uh, we thought that was strange, and we didn't know what would cause that. And then, of course, later, uh, everyone felt a sense of vertigo as they were over in Homestead 2 area. And uh, even my, my brother Cameron, who is the pilot, uh, didn't feel comfortable sticking around, wanted to go back to, uh, to the airport and wait until we summoned him uh, to, to depart later in the afternoon. But, uh, and then later... We had an individual who was rendered catatonic, who was there as attending security for a visiting dignitary. And, and that started really raising eyebrows. I mean, the, the smartphone malfunctions, the, you know, the experiences, what people were feeling, and then seeing this huge six foot six figure who, who claimed that he could bench press 700 pounds, literally rendered catatonic for a period of 10 minutes. And then following that, you know, we have this, what could only be described as a UFO sighting. That changed everything. And from that point on, we, we fully instrumented the property. We added all of the scientific platforms. You know, we now have approximately 50 surveillance cameras, night vision, thermographic imaging. I mean, the, the most advanced FLIR camera systems. We even have infrasonic sensor systems, our own weather station avionics receiving platforms and tracking uh, to, to hopefully be able to differentiate from that which is conventional to that which may have some, some other origin or may be unusual. And we brought all of those things to bear in order to, to document the reality of what is happening in this really interesting place. One, one more question, then you can go to the audience. But I'm just, so I don't know how much you can say about, you know, at this point, how you what you understand the nature of this phenomenon to be because i i wonder about the the fear factor i mean obviously there's a sort of malevolence about it or there's something sort of negative about it um and you guys are out there in the field you know testing that and risk taking risks 
And um, does it feel like it's something kind of dark and scary, or, or does it, or does it feel like there's other elements to to it that aren't that way? I mean, I, I how do liken, you relate to it? Yeah, I liken the phenomena to to really any neighborhood in the United States or anywhere in the world. You're going to have bad actors. You're going to have benevolent. You're going to have malevolent people, good people, people that are somewhere in between. I don't think the universe is any different. I think the universe is just one huge, vast neighborhood. And I don't think that what we are experiencing is anything different. I think we have data showing that there is malevolence involved, that there is intent to harm. There's also benevolence. People have had beautiful experiences, positive experiences, believe it or not. And then others have found it to be more benign. And, uh, and I think what we're seeing is a diversity. People ask me all the time, as you can imagine, is it extraterrestrial? Are we seeing visitors from other worlds, or is it, is it interdimensional? Does this fit within Jacques Vallée's, you know, IDH, interdimensional hypothesis, or is it angels and demons? Is it spiritual or related to consciousness? And I think the answer, based on the data, is that it is all of the above, and that there is a diversity. I don't think that there is any one point of origin or agenda, I think that there are countless different entities that we are dealing with, not only at Skinwalker Ranch, but here on this planet. And I don't think Bob Bigelow is far off as far as making the statement that they're among us, that, that if we only knew, you know, we'd be very surprised. We've been visited. We've probably been visited since the beginning of time. Uh, I and, agree. Yeah. and I think it is, as you look at the Webb telescope, and the insight rendering images from the universe and how many exoplanets can continue to be discovered and how much our own history continues to be rewritten. I mean, archaeology, I mean, how many times is National Geographic going to have to reset the clock as far as when human habitation or, you know, when people were using skills or tools or implements? I mean, my heavens. I mean, we're seeing an evolutionary process right now as far as understanding our own place on this planet and the universe. And I think uh, we're, we are just in our infancy. And, I, and Skinwalker Ranch, to a degree, is, a, is an active living laboratory for hopefully discovering not only the nature of, of what we're dealing with, but really our place in the universe. And, and people have probably seen me pontificate on this, but answer the age-old questions of... Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? Are we alone? Is there something more to life? I, I don't think that it's a coincidence that Bigelow is now funding, you know, life after death research and, and consciousness studies uh, because that, right. that ends up being an outgrowth to a degree of a lot of these yeah. things. Have you, have, do you feel you have discovered what it is about this specific location? Like, I've, I know you talk about a vortex, there's like a vortex no, I there. I have no idea. What is it about that, that draws it there? Uh, it is centered. Well, one thing that we found that was very interesting, the Uinta Basin is truly a bowl. It is a, it is a, it is a basin. And this property, for whatever reason, whether this is, this is one of the, the reason for the phenomena being focused on this area, but it is right in the dead center. And you can pull it up, pull up any Google Earth or to, you know, topographical map, and you're going to see this. Uh, there is something strange about the Mesa. Uh, and again, I, I thought that uh, we probably wouldn't find anything, and as we have, as we have uh, explored that region, we're seeing some anomalous things. And, and there seems to be something both below the ranch and above that ranch that, that is meddling with some of the most advanced instrumentation on the planet. To have GPS, GPS systems employed using helicopters, airplanes, balloons, instrumented rocketry, all malfunctioning above this property repeatedly. It, it, it's pointing us in a direction. And then you see that there are things that are signaling something below the property that may be embedded. There's an old Masonic symbol that, uh, that I found etched in the Mesa uh, Plateau, the face when I first toured the property that was shown to me by the, uh, the former security officer. And uh, many people 
identify that it's it's basically symbolizing as above so below and i thought it was interesting i thought it was oh yet another really intriguing part of the lore it is very old the the patina the age and the patina on this drawing it's very old and uh, yeah it's at least from sometime in the 1800s but it is definitely not contemporary and and boy has that held true as far as you know, seeing that there really is something going on above and below that property that that is not only getting our interest, but also capturing the interest of other enterprises that are disturbing. I mean, if you've seen any of you've seen the trailers recently that we've been dropping, Black Hawk helicopters showing up at 11 o'clock at night in the midst of experiments that are not transponding, that are unmarked. Army Special Ops Chinook helicopters, also unmarked, not transponding, that show up in the midst of experiments and are sweeping the property. Um, yeah, I have resources, but I don't have those kind of resources. I can't just snap my finger and summon a hundred million dollars or more of military assets to come just show up at the property simultaneous with experiments. Something is going on. And and we are definitely poking the hornet's nest, and and I think it underscores the importance of our investigation. That's why I think it's the. If it wasn't the greatest science project of our time, why you know, why wouldn't we be left alone? I mean, what we we'd yeah, just be left to our own devices. But so, yeah. something we're we're disturbing someone. That's, or that's a kind of a new aspect of it, right? The helicopters are showing up. Well, no, the, it's no? that has been reported. Okay. For decades, what is new is actually documenting it, getting it on camera. And that's what is game changing. None of this is made for TV. Any right. anyone who thinks that this is all made for television hasn't been paying attention the last several years to to the countless interviews that we've been doing and the transparency that we brought to these topics. I mean, the only reason why there's a docu series is, is it is because there is a full-time scientific investigation going on year-round with a team, a diversified team of professionals that have been engaged by me since 2016 in service right. to these topics. Right. Well, I, I commend you for what you've been doing, Brandon. Uh, it's a great service for all of us that you're Thanks. doing that. Yeah. Thanks. Because I want to know more than any of you, and I can honestly say that. I want to know the truth. I want to know the agenda, the origin, the nature of what we are dealing with more than anyone and and putting my money, my reputation, everything on the line. And guess what? I don't own it. I consider myself a steward. I consider myself a conduit to bring these things forward and to share everything that we discover with the public. And I look forward to it. It just the timing associated with releasing some of the material, it's a little bit frustrating sometimes, but it'll be worth it, like Christmas. It'll be <laughs> worth it. You remember when mom and dad would tell you, don't, you can't go unwrap the presents, don't sneak up there. Um, it's kind of like that. Yeah, it must be hard to sit on it. Well, should we, should we open it up to questions now? Yeah. Bring it audience? on. All right, I'll, I'll start with one from the live stream, and then we'll go over to the audience here. Uh, this is from Pete of Paranormal Book. Question for Brandon. Have, how have your business colleagues acted differently, say positively, negatively, otherwise, since the History Channel show started? I, the ones that are negative that would ridicule me are too cowardly to face me. So I would say that in general, I've had a very positive experience. Uh, people, People who've known me for decades, who've known me and can track my career, know that I don't, that I, I, I don't f around. I don't, I don't do anything halfway. I'm not some fringe guy. I, I've done billions of dollars of business. I represent Fortune 500 companies, some, some of the largest institutions in the world. And I'm not going to put my reputation professionally on the line if I don't know that there's reality to this, that there's validity to it. And again, I'm sorry for my language. Is this this is not going to be public domain, right? Oh, I mean, we're 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 so positive here. <laughs> sorry. 
sorry. I'm, I'm in New York, not Utah, so I kind of think, right? If I'm in Utah, especially Utah County, I get to watch myself or I get burned at the stake, but, uh, and I say that in, in the most loving way, but um, anyways. So, so the answer was no. Guess what? I've been surprised at the number of CEOs, captains of industry, and thought leaders that have finally had the courage that they've reached out to me and said, I've had my own experiences that I can't deny. I've seen it. I know it's real. Thank you for sticking your neck out there and bringing these things to the public. Okay. Hi there. Uh, my name is Sinead, and I'm just thrilled that you're here. This is uh, really wonderful, wonderful content. So thank you so much, not only for what you're doing, but for being here to speak about it and share it with us. It's so exciting. Um, I know it's also terrifying, but it's exciting. So my question to you is, um, I have spoken with James Keenan, who has been on your land. He's a researcher. And he and I share a passionate interest in the indigenous people, the story of indigenous people when it comes to what they call uh, the star people, the star families, mm -hmm. and their relationship with uh, that cosmic that cosmic relationship that has gone on for generations and generations. And we have ignored that knowledge that they have had for so many hundreds of years. So I know that you are surrounded by tribal lands. I know that the indigenous people are often very protective of that oral history that they have passed on for so many generations so preciously and that they're very careful about sharing it with people outside of tribes because of how it has been used in the past. So my question for you is, while you're collecting this incredible data with your scientists and your researchers, are you also in contact with those tribes? Are they sharing any information for you? And what is that like? Because apparently, the malevolence has to do with a fierce protection of the land. And so I'm curious if that has any truth, and just in general, what these people are sharing with you, if anything. Good question. Uh one of my highest priorities when purchasing the ranch, even as a skeptic that I executed on immediately was, was tasking my manager, Jim Morse, with going out and meeting with the Native American tribal leaders and neighbors to help them understand that not only are we friendly and collaborative, but we respect their culture. We respect their history. We are there as a guest that that we are all there seeking truth and and we wanted to set a different tone for not only the the ownership but the investigation and he's done a remarkable job jim you probably all know who jim jim morse i've known since i was 18 years old he was my first developer client when i was 18 trying to sell office buildings and lease office parks and He's, uh, he's the most interesting man in the world. Um, he's the guy with the Indian vest, with the cowboy hat that usually is, is really my community liaison. He's the most interesting man in the world. Uh, you know, the Dos Equis commercials, they, they base that person on him. You don't know that, but I'm kidding, kind of. <laughs> but, I mean, he's the only person I know that can claim that he's, that can truthfully claim that he's smoked weed with Bob Marley. He's sat with... Hugh Hefner in the grotto like 25 times. He's done deals with Stan Lee with, from Marvel. He's dove for lost treasure off of exotic locales. He's done it all. And, and along with that, real estate development. But more than that, he has the biggest heart that I've ever known. And he loves the Native American peoples. He's raised millions of dollars for scholarships, for aid. And we've really made it a priority to involve the indigenous peoples to inv involve tribal leaders and their spiritual leaders and have them come out to not only bless the property and interact with the team, but share their perspective and stories. You see that evidence in the series where we've had a number of uh, respected people. And so long-winded answer to your question, yes, um, we think that's an important part of our stewardship. I think that there is a spiritual element, and I'm just calling it spiritual because there's, it's a hard to frame it in any other way, but there's a historical aspect that goes back to the ancients that they've known about, um, that we are somewhat ignorant to as interlopers, um, that we're, we're just finally understanding. There are petroglyphs 
on this site. There's a megalithic site and petroglyphs that speak to, with star charts, that speak to an ancient um, origin and knowledge associated with what is happening within the basin in this property that I, I believe um, is is leading us down different paths. So, yeah, we're, we're going to continue as that's an important part of our of our work. Yes, Brandon. So thank you again for your, your incredible contributions to the cause, to the subject. Um, so in regard to the land in the Uinta Basin itself, um, it is kind of a geoparabolic topography, right? So I'm curious if you guys have looked into Fort Duchesne in 1886, the army fort that was built there. You bet. They had a Masonic Lodge. The Buffalo Soldiers had a, a major presence there. And, and that surrounding area has had a wealth of history associated with, with not only um, a diversity of people that have come with, from different, different belief systems and whatnot, but there is a, a, there is a consistent theme. A uh, researcher, his name is Joseph Junior Hicks. Junior Hicks, who had uh, documented sightings and uh, UFO activity in the basin since 1950 became a part of our extended family and team. And we, we inherited his files, which, uh, which, which were merged with the Bigelow Advanced Aerospace Studies files to, to gain a, a better understanding of what has happened historically in the area and beyond. But I think there may be something to do with that early um, habitation. Absolutely, and just one more part to do with the topography in the area. Yeah. Um, uh, chromium mines, are you aware of, of those being in the area? I, I am, but I haven't really spent a lot of time researching it, so I'm somewhat ignorant okay. to that. Fair enough. I'm not sure if that, we'll see. I'm sure my team, my science, my scientists will come, come to, uh, to hopefully see if there's some validity to that or tie. Okay, you are early hand. Yep. Oh, oh. Bring it on. Cool, yeah, thank you. You want, I, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Hey. And then we'll get to all of you. I will try my best. We'll, we'll try to rapid fire move th through all of this, but I want to answer everyone's sincere questions. It's all right. I'm not long-winded. So um, you said in an interview, uh, kind of as an offhand comment, that um, if I recall correctly that... Um, uh, Bigelow was going to not release uh, the NIDS information to you or otherwise. Um, and if that's true, if I remember, if I heard correctly, then, you know, I find that very frustrating. And just to preempt, I mean, I don't know if that would really be covered, especially in its entirety, under any kind of confidentiality issues, because it is private data rather than public. So if you could please speak to it. Thank you. You bet. Uh, my acquisition of the property was as is. Mr. Bigelow made it very clear that the material associated with his investigation would remain either classified or private, proprietary. And frankly, I thought it was all a bunch of baloney anyway, so what did I care? At the end of the day, I was like, okay, well, that gives me a clean slate. That gives me a, a new foundation and a base to work from. And I don't really feel any differently. I, I feel like we we've presented the best data and the best evidence associated with the phenomena on that property. And I mean, before I went public in March, 2020, you had the George Knapp's book. You had Ryan Skinner's weird half-assed website. And, and I love Ryan. It was a great thing, but I mean, he, he'll admit he was just trying to figure it out as he went along. There were, and a bunch of stories. It was all anecdotal. There was no data. There was no open, transparent uh, view of the ranch and the investigation. And, and so I actually, in some respects, I thank Mr. Bigelow because it, it, made me, it made me invest the resources into bringing a, a new team of experts to the property to, to I think, develop a, 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 a record and, um, and evidence associated with the phenomena. Would, would I love to collaborate? Would I love to, to have access to some of that data? Sure. 
but I don't think it's going to reveal anything more than what we have already revealed so far. And then some, I mean, what I found when I bought the property was a broke down, it was a cattle guard gate with a rusted, rusted chain and a padlock. There was no active surveillance. I mean, there was a fax machine that was being used to fax Mr. Bigelow. And again, no disrespect because I, we stand on the shoulders of giants, but there really was no infrastructure to conduct a sophisticated investigation in my view. So um, I'm glad I, I was able to start from ground zero. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I'm wondering if there are any other locations on the planet that you know of that have similar characteristics. We are investigating that right now. In fact, get ready. The next, the, in the next, um, in the next few weeks, we will, yeah, we'll we'll start addressing that. But yes, absolutely. In fact, I I'm. I am very much interested in seeing if there are other sites of interest that are exhibiting the same type of phenomena and developing, developing a data set that will help us better understand what we're dealing with. I like to say and echo my principal investigator, Eric Bard, who's, who says um, we are not led by a narrative. We are led by the data. Even though we've inherited a narrative from our predecessors, we are data driven and we're allowing that to guide our investigation. Next question. Court. Uh, Brandon, thanks so much. Um, in your scientific team and with all of the instrumentation that you apparently have on site, does your team include uh, psychologists and are, is there an element, I guess what I'm asking is, does your science include a question about the intent of your staff? Or I should say, uh, measuring their responses. I see where you're going. Um, do we have a psychologist? No, we have a published credentialed anthropologist full-time on site. We have a full-time physicist who is a plasma physis physicist who holds countless patents. I mean, Eric Bard can do circles around virtually anyone. I mean, if any of you saw Eric Weinstein's Joe Rogan podcast recently, Eric Weinstein, bless his heart, said, hey, uh, he acknowledged that Eric Bard is one of the only people that can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and keep pace with him. Um, he wasn't just being nice. Eric Weinstein isn't just nice. He just says the truth. And, and, and shares his perspective. But uh, we don't have a psychologist. We've tried to have a multidisciplinary approach. I mean, we've looked at the cultural aspect. We are, though, to get to the heart of your question or the tail end of it, we are documenting incidents and how people have reacted to, yeah, and because the, the ranch has an impact on people from a psychological standpoint. In fact, we, we encourage people to take a break if they feel like something, it's like the Shining Hotel. Have any of you seen the Shining? Remember how it kind of screwed up, Jack? Um, I think, true, true story, I think the ranch, there's something similar going on where, I mean, it can drive people mad. It can manipulate consciousness. Whatever we are dealing with, is so much more advanced than we can comprehend. And it's not always nice. It can sense intent. It can size you up in just a moment. And, uh, and it does have command over space time and technology in ways that just are baffling and undeniable. Seeing how that impacts people and their psychology it, it's it's a key it's it's a data point right it's a key part of the data set in understanding the nature of what we're dealing with next question yes on that point of data where's the data going like is there a repository of the data at the end of the day right now the majority of it is is held there on the on the ranch in the command center we do have a site um, 
skinwalker-ranch.com. So we have an, a, a website, a web portal that I established uh, when I went public. And we've, we've added an insider function to that site. So anyone in the room, you can, you can actually live stream not only what is happening on the ranch and see for yourself uh, and data log observations. I mean, a lot of what we're doing is observational science, but you can interact with Eric, with Dragon, with Caleb, with Tom Winterton on a regular basis. In fact, I don't think that there's a day that goes by that Eric Bard, my principal investigator and physicist, out there is not interacting with the public through the insider portal uh, which is unique show me another show me another scientific endeavor on the planet where its principal investigator is interacting with the general public and is that transparent good luck good luck and i can, that's why i get so pissed off at a lot of the skeptics because i feel like can i be any more transparent than this i mean what more do you want i mean what they and everyone talks of peer review, which I do respect. However, in order to have something peer reviewed, you, you have to have a complete data set. You have to be prepared. You have to be organized. And we're still in the process of repeating experiments and research and, and pulling that data together. But to answer your question, some of that is very public. Yeah, I mean, some of, you know, like temperature, and humidity, all kinds of yeah. We have a weather station out there that's monitoring that. Spectrum analyzers. So we have some of the most, I think it's, we have the most advanced spectrum analyzers that you can buy, that money can buy. I know, because I bought it. Not the, not the History Channel. So I love, my partners at History are awesome, and they have, they've kept their word. They have not manipulated anything. They haven't faked anything. But let me be very clear. I have acquired that equipment. And most of it, in fact, Literally, what you see on the screen was in place long before there was a doc, a docu series effort. I had no intention. I mean, that wasn't made for TV. It was made so we could get to the bottom of the truth. Oh, you? Are, are, is he next? Uh, Bring it on. Hello. Um, two questions. Uh, first, has anyone done any predictive uh, analysis on the people who come to the ranch and the experiences they have i'm like can you do you have an idea statistically somehow of what kind of experience someone's going to have on the ranch before they get there and the second question is did anyone figure out what those invisible columns were that you uh, gosh good questions two big questions um there's something called the hitchhiker effect so we have documented and we've been tracking experiences that people have had off the property after visiting the ranch. And we have been developing a data set tracking those individuals, what they're experiencing. I will say this. Uh, whatever we are interacting with out there, whatever exists on the ranch, call it the phenomena, call it entities, whatever. It, one thing that is somewhat predictive is if you bring a spirit of aggression, if you bring an adversarial attitude, it seems to react in kind. The ranch is reflexive. If you bring a spirit of humility and reverence, you are more likely to have a positive experience or not a, not have a negative experience. Uh, and and that has been borne out in the data. Uh, your other question with the with reference to the the columns, the anomalous columns, we're still trying to figure out what that is. Uh, other th I will say it is real. The fact that there's whether you it's an electromagnetic anomaly whether there is something manipulating the instrumentation during the photogrammetry. I mean, what, you're, what he's referencing, we, we've had repeated experiments with, with drones, with some of the most advanced LIDAR and photogrammetry equipment that have picked up anomalies above certain regions of the property. And, and we keep going back to test those regions to see if there's, if there's more to be revealed. Okay. All right. Uh, we've got a question from Kurt Jaimungo. Hi, Brandon. Hey. Given that earlier you referred to there being potentially at least 
two data points of high intense phenomenon spots. So one being Skinwalker and the others you said may be revealed in a few weeks. Or Mo months, in the okay. next few months. Can you use that information to whittle down the space of reasons why some locations are more likely to have exceptional activities than, than others? So for instance, by seeing what it has in common with Skinwalker, perhaps they're both in basins or perhaps they both have Walker yeah. in their name or whatever. Yeah, or there may be common geology. I don't know, we'll see. I don't know. Um, we're pulling that together right now. What I do know is that what we are experiencing at what we are experiencing at Skinwalker Ranch isn't confined to just that location. I mean, it, for we do have a high frequency of UFO sightings, electromagnetic anomalies, and other high strangeness that is unique to that property for whatever reason. Does that exist in other locales? Yeah, um, but not not necessarily to the the same degree. But we're trying to see what kind of common common traits other properties may have what what is drawing the phenomena to other locations and and how much of the human element how much does consciousness play a role in that potentially uh next was that a good answer did that answer kind of sort of hello um my question was and i hope it's not being too repetitive but um uh, I'm wondering if you have intentionally availed yourself of human instrumentation. Have you ever intentionally brought psych uh, psychics or mediums or remote viewers and, and use that specifically to try and contact or, or, I don't know, maybe just show results or gain some information? Or is that something that you wouldn't do? No, we have. So we've brought remote viewers out to the site um, we've we've conducted a number of exercises. I mean, we'll see. I'm not quite sure what will show up in season four. We have a lot of footage. I have to say, and this is this is one of the frustrations is you only have so much time to present, and when you're organizing thousands and thousands of hours of footage, I mean terabytes of data, and you have to so much ends up on the cutting room floor. Um, I I think. Remote viewing, I was a skeptic. Uh, Open-minded, but very skeptical. I am no longer skeptical. Um, I've, I've now shifted from skeptic to believer to actual experiencer when it comes to remote viewing. I've seen the data. I've seen absolute evidence that it is real. And that should, that's both inspiring, that should thrill everyone and scare everyone to death as well it's real though it's absolutely real and yes we are trying to employ that to gain further insight uh, in the spirit of uh, getting fired up about skeptics I understand that uh, Stephen Greenstreet went to the to the property mm -hmm. uh, did you think he was operating in good faith and can you tell us a little bit about the nature of that interaction time will tell won't it um, I, uh, Mr. Greenstreet with the New York Post reached out to me a year ago and said that he'd been tasked to do a series on Skinwalker Ranch. He had been very open in his criticism and skepticism and he, and he stated as much to me. He said, y you're aware that I've taken a very negative tone and negative approach to the ranch. And I told him, I said, you're wrong. I'm sorry to tell you this, but you're very, very wrong. And he said, oh, yeah? Would you let, why, if I'm so wrong, it was something, it was a, we had, we had a really good positive exchange, and it was friendly, but it, very quickly, um, he, he asked me, he said, well, why don't you let me come out? You know, would you let me come out for myself and see for myself what you're doing? And I said, sure, done. You bet. I have nothing to hide. I'm not running some scam, which is what he was in. He's inferred in so many different interviews and in so much of his work, he infers that there's some type of scam going on. There's some type of deception. I said, come on out um, because there's no deception. Uh, we have a team of credentialed people and we're conducting a very real investigation and um, and I welcomed it. His motives, we'll see. 
I don't know. Uh, he has another episode dropping, probably his last, perhaps in the next week or so. I suspect, I mean, he's come with his own biases. That's come out in his his last episode, and I think we all bring, we're all, a, we are all a product of our own experiences. I think he may be projecting some of his own experiences and bias into his, uh, his reporting, which is understandable. And, uh, but believe it or not, I really, uh, fell in love with the guy. I, I actually, when we, when we parted ways, I remember giving him a huge hug and I honestly enjoyed my interaction with Steven. And, um, my hope is that he'll just tell the truth. Bring it on, Mike. Hi, just a quick clarifying question. You mentioned that your uh, sort of paradigm shifting moment was seeing seeing this uh, disc shaped object. Did I hear you say that someone that Eric maybe caught that on his phone? On no, no, our phones were dead. Um, I'm so pissed about it. But I have to be honest. I'm gonna be honest though. Did we all have the presence of mind to all of a sudden go grab our cameras or phones if they were working? Uh, I don't know. I was so stunned. I mean, we were traveling back. We were on the, the dirt road at the base of the Mesa, and we're driving along, and I'm driving this open-air Polaris Ranger, and in the back seat, one of the security guards that was there for, for the day that was accompanying a guest started yelling, stop the vehicle, stop the vehicle. I'm like, what? She's just yet shouting in the back seat, and I look back, and he's waving his arms up in the air, so I bring it to an abrupt stop, and, uh, and he's pointing. He says, look. Do you see what I'm seeing? And I look exactly where he's pointing, right, right ahead of us. And sure enough, there's this huge, there's this 40, 50 foot long object. And then within seconds, it changed position. It just, it was like a video game. It changed position. Then a few seconds later, it drops down to kind of a hover right, abo uh, right above the mace. And then it darted right seconds later, and then it was gone. And I have to tell you, the whole thing, it was about 20 seconds I will say, Eric Bard, after the event, said, don't talk to each other. I want to be able to sequester each one of you individually because I want your independent testimony. I don't want you corroborating. I want to have a very clear, definitive record. And all of, I, I've never met these individuals before that day. I haven't spoken to them since, but our record is identical. And, and it's undeniable. Um, I wish I had a photographic record, but here's the thing. If we're dealing with something that has command over space-time, over consciousness, I mean, it's going to re... We're not in control. Any of you th who think that we're under... that we have some control over this, and I have to tell you, that's probably the most terrifying thing. I think the people that are probably the most terrified are the people within our national security apparatus. I, a lot of people are like, well, why aren't they bringing this to the public? Why aren't there congressional hearings? I mean, we've heard this in some of the panels earlier. Well, I bet that they're all, I, I don't think they know. And you think about that. If there, are, if there are objects, if there are entities that are able to enter our airspace, violate our airspace indiscriminately, and are able to manipulate consciousness, and are so advanced, I mean, all bets are off. There is no security. I mean, it's all an illusion. Just like there's no job security. Anyone who thinks there's job security, you're only as good as your next deal. You're only as good as w the service you're providing. But at, uh, yeah, I don't know if I kind of meandered off on a tangent. I. <laughs> I'm going to let you answer a question, and I'm, I'll try to get to, I'll get to whoever. I, I, if we want to go late, unless we're good being kicked out of this place. Okay. All right. Um, no, you, live you live here? Oh, you live here. Oh, my gosh. So we're in your house. Well, um, boy, you have the conch. Remember Lord of the Flies? The conch is yours. Yeah, 
Oh, gosh, I don't know the indigenous na- indigenous name off the top of my head. I should know that. It's like, uh, you know, it's something else. Um, it, Skinwalker is a, is a, comes from Native American tradition. It is a shape-shifting demonic entity. It's essentially a Native American witch that has sold their soul in exchange for immortality and the ability to take on the skin of of another. And, and to shapeshift. It isn't always in the form of a wolf or a dire wolf or, a, or, or some type of bipedal monster. It, it can even take on the, the shape of a bird or anything else if you, if you delve into the history. Um, they believe it. Skinwalkers are as real to the Native Americans as Leslie is here or those flowers. To question if uh, they, I have met with so many that say that they've witnessed it. They you know it's real. Their ancestors knew it was real. How it relates to the UFO phenomena and why all of this is converging in one place. I mean, the property was referred to as Skinwalker Ranch. It was a nickname that the Bigelow team started giving it. Uh, that was derived from the ridge that runs the entire expanse of the property, the Mesa Plateau that had been cursed uh, in association with a fall with fallout between the Ute and the Navajo tribe. The Utes had side, sided with the United States government in the 1800s and had been selling the Navajos into s- slavery. And in the midst of that great contention, the Navajo cursed the property. And it was funny, the first day that I uh, saw the property, it was, the, it was a few days before I closed on it, which was the first week in April 2016, I came in in my helicopter, and I'd never driven out there. All I'd seen it was I just pulled up Google Earth maps and whatnot, but I didn't really have the time to go out there and inspect it before that time. It was funny. When I dropped down in the helicopter, I was greeted by armed security, by Bigelow Security, who proceeded to give me a tour of the property. And as we went out to the perimeter, out to the west perimeter of the property that borders the Native American tribal property, there were, there were animal carcasses hanging from the fence line. And I said, what the hell? What is that gross crap hanging from the fence? And he says, well, those are animal bladders that have been blessed by the tribe to keep demonic forces on your property and off theirs. Um, there's some bad stuff going on there. Um, I will say, and I'm going to answer, I'll try to get to t- whatever you want. It's your show. But um, I do want to say um, there are a lot of people that have criticized or, or, or been skeptical that, well, all of this has been manufactured by the Sherman family who then ended up selling it to a gullible Robert Bigelow. And I have to tell you, one of the most surprising aspects of my ownership and my investigation is the fact that so many incidents occurred on that property long before Sherman. I mean, we've had the deputy sheriff who worked with Kenneth Myers who came out and responded to bizarre cattle mutilation events, UFO sightings, all sorts of high strangeness. We've had others independently come forward with multiple witnesses going back decades, long before this was on anyone's radar, long before the Shermans, long before Bigelow, and uh, have finally been willing to come forward because they see that we are conducting a serious research effort. Um, what, what pisses me off about the skeptics, they know this. I've, I don't know how many times I've repeated this. I've given citations online in the public record, and they, they conveniently disregard anything and dismiss and bury anything that doesn't fit their narrative. They are just as guilty of, confir- of confirmation bias and dishonesty as the people that they ridicule for being gullible. There is, there's a lot of work to be done on both sides of the, uh, the equation. Sorry. Anyone more? Are we done? I, I've, got, I've got one from the live stream, uh, and that's uh, from Christian Morales asking, you know, with these Chinook helicopters, with these black helicopters, etc., kind of magically showing up during these investigations, have you ever felt um, threatened yourself 
or threatened in general for the property on behalf of whatever this, you know, governmental or non-governmental military or non-military entity is Co Covert doing. military. When they're unmarked and they're not transponding, which is against the law, there's a problem. Has my team felt threatened? Hell yes. After they're running experiments and it, it, late at night, a Black Hawk helicopter shows up and literally just drops down to a hover right above the south field, just south of the ranch house in Homestead 1, and just sits there with its lights off. Um, yeah, my people have been very concerned. They're outgunned. They're outclassed. I mean, Dragon, he looks mean. He's got permanent bitch face, but he doesn't have a Black Hawk. He doesn't, we don't have that kind of artillery or arsenal. That's a technical term, by the way. Um, and, and my, my last thing would be, Leslie, do you have uh, any, last, any last question for Brandon or anything? Else? I'd rather give it to somebody else. Okay. Okay, Annie, give me a hard question. Make me uncomfortable. Make it awkward, please. I see, I see one from Kirsten Blackburn. For the love. And we're gonna I came all the way from Utah. <laughs> I came all the way from Utah. Okay, Kirsten Blackburn, and then we got to call it. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Do you have any girls on your team? <laughs> yes. Our, our full-time, so let me tell you, our full, our, our full-time... Our full-time anthropologist and uh, caretaker, Candace Lindy, who you can go on Amazon, search Candace Lindy, K-A-N-D-U-S-L-I-N-D-E. She's published a textbook on anthropology. She's been on archaeological digs all over the world. She's very credentialed. Uh, she's been there since the beginning, uh, since the, we launched, since before the docu-series effort launched. Uh, we've also brought others. I mean, Michelle, who's a Native American, has consulted with us uh, on site. We've had several um, females, both pilots. We've had uh, pilots and other instrumentalists. In fact, the uh, from the University of Alabama at Huntsville, uh, we've I can't remember her name, Kate, that came out uh, that helped really officiate over our first advanced instrumented rocketry experiments that yielded some really interesting interesting results. UFOs appeared in tandem with, uh, with that event. So yes, uh, do we need to do, we, we need to do better. Um, I'm looking forward to bringing more uh, professionals. All I care, all I care about is that they're qualified. That's all I care. I don't care about anything else. Just bring it on. And my wife's been out there more than a lot of people. So my wife, Kristen, who's kind of put up with all this for a long time. <laughs> and uh, with that, um, we are going to have to call it tonight, but we are so thrilled. Thank you all so much for the support. Thank you all so much for the interest. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Keep fighting. Okay. keep fighting. Don't put up with any crap. Just keep, keep fighting for the truth. Right on. Yeah. Great last word. Every time that we enter the ranch, we've seen more evidence of the reality of the phenomenon, and we are committed to getting the answers. There is something metallic in the mesa. We should be digging, drilling right there. You feel like this may be a dangerous area to be working in? Very. The drill has encountered a hard object that it cannot penetrate. You're not going to believe this. There's a heat source right above them. The deeper down the rabbit hole that we travel, the more complex that it appears. This is the largest scale experiment that we've ever done here so far. There's something in the sky above the rocket. We may be looking at the anomaly for the first time, guys. We have a helicopter right over the triangle. It just went dark. It was a Black Hawk helicopter. It's pretty clear somebody has taken an interest in what we're doing. The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, new season, Tuesday, April 18th at 10, on the History Channel.